Hello everyone, welcome to another Florida Native Plant Society Lunch and Learn. Uh, this is one of our public lunch and learns. Uh, as you may, may or may not know, most of our lunch and learns are restricted to only our members, but once a month or so, we have uh, lunch and learns that are available to members of the public. So if you're a member of the public and not a member of the Florida Native Plant Society, welcome. We encourage you to join us. Um, I will post a link to join in the chat here once I'm done introducing Lily. So Lily is our director of North Florida programs and she's based in Tallahassee. I'm based in Kissimmee and she is uh, a wealth of knowledge on native plants and ecology. And so Without further ado, take away Lily. Hi, welcome everyone. Um, so I had the idea to give this talk because um, as many of you have heard um, in the news that the monarch butterfly is now considered officially endangered. But it's been kind of confusing for a lot of people because it's not federally listed with the US government as endangered. It has been listed by the International Union for um, oh, conservation of nature, ICUN, IUCN, and it they have listed it, it as a threatened species, um, but that doesn't have any effect on the way it's managed or legalities or you know management of the species in the U.S. Unfortunately, the um, butterfly is still under review. It's been under review for a few years and. Um, it should be, uh, we should have a decision by the end of 2024, at least, hopefully. Um, and hopefully it will get listed as endangered because with that would come a lot of habitat protection and which would mean conservation of land. And because this is a migratory species, there's a lot of land considered. And that would conserve a whole lot, of, that could potentially conserve a whole lot of land and a whole lot of other species, plant, both plants and animals with it. So this is this population that in the US and uh, the Eastern US is, and in the West, there are special populations because they migrate. So monarchs are native to different other continents as well but this is the only population that migrates. And it's really unusual that this tropical butterfly has evolved and adapted to expand its range through migration, because that's really odd for a butterfly. And so it's, and when we are thinking about, you know, um, having, um, nectaring plants and supplying nectar for this species, throughout its migration, you have to consider what time of year it will be coming through your area and what type of plants will be blooming at that time. So as you can see here in the spring, the spring bloom uh, breeding areas, they come, so they overwinter in, in Mexico, as you can see down on the map, <laughs> and they move north in the spring. And I usually, I'm in the panhandle, I usually see them around April, May, when they're starting to come north. And they'll continue north, so then you don't typically see many of them again until late summer. And then in fall, we get a massive population migrating through the Florida panhandle. And so as you can see on the map, not the entire state of Florida, the monarchs that exist in Florida, they're not all migratory. The Southern population has evolved to become no longer migratory because the um, climate is tropical down there and they can overwinter and continue to succeed in South Florida, which presents some other issues as well. But for the time being, providing as much Nectarine plants year round is important if you're in South Florida. And that's a lot easier because the climate is warm mostly year round. And so there are a lot more things blooming. And then in um, North Florida and North Central Florida, we see them in the spring, as I said again, and then the big population comes through in the fall. This map is from the Xerxes Society website, and I definitely recommend them as a resource for anything invertebrate, invertebrate related, but especially for monarchs as well. 
So your yard matters. Um, which species will make it and which will not. We help to make the decision every time we add or remove something from our yards. And that's a quote from Doug Tallamy. He is an incredible author and speaker um, and entomologist who has uh, provided a lot of research on the very complex and interconnected relationship between native plants and native insects and how that relationship supports the entire rest of the food web that supports all of our ecosystems. And so his big statement is that we're losing more and more land to development and human habitation every year. And so what we plant in those, in our yards, in our commercial landscapes has become critically important because Without native plants, our ecosystems collapse. And so what you add or remove, especially invasive plants, can have cascading effects to the rest of the ecosystem. So even a little action like planting native milkweed and some native um, nectarine plants can make a big difference in the long run. Oh. All right, there we go. So I have to mention tropical milkweed real, just briefly. I'm not going to go into it too much, but it, it is a problematic species. So this is this species is tropical, as the name suggests. It's not native to Florida, um, but it has become naturalized, and I would consider it invasive uh, in various areas across Florida. You can see this little map on the right-hand side of the screen. The green counties are counties that have been vouchered to have this plant um, naturalizing and spreading in those areas. This has caused a lot of issues. One, as you can see, um, this species is grown on a very large commercial scale, and then it's heavily treated with neonicotinoids, which is a systemic pesticide that stays in the plant, all parts of the plant for months and months and months and months, like six to eight months. And so even the nectar and, you know, the um, the leaves, if monarchs lay their eggs and caterpillars start eating it, those are both toxic to insects and monarchs. So that's a big problem. The other thing is that it's invasive, as I mentioned, and it is tropical, so it doesn't have a natural senescence period. It doesn't naturally die back to the ground and then come back up in the spring because tropical species don't have winters. And so they haven't adapted for that. And that has caused an issue because um, this parasite that monarchs have evolved with um, and can live with if, it, if the numbers don't increase too much, it's called OE, um, that parasite can accumulate in, in dangerous numbers on this species because it never dies back, which effectively cleans the parasite off the leaves. So the, and we, there's also some evidence now that just, that suggests even the um, interaction of a monarch in the process of migrating with this species can stop, prevent the monarch from migrating further. So it's just causing a lot of issues and Native plants are always the best choice. And so I recommend not planting tropical milkweed, um, slowly removing it from your yard if you have it, and planting native milkweed. Okay, so if you wanna learn more about the OE issue, tropical milkweed and all of the problems with it, and get some references for resources to read more about it, I wrote this blog for our FNPS blog and it goes into the very specifics of all of that. Okay, so fall flowering nectarine plants. The majority of the plants that we're gonna discuss today, um, almost all of them are fall bloomers because that's when the major large populations come through North Florida. And that's when we see the most amount of monarchs in fall. And almost all of the plants are uh, in that one family, in the Asteraceae family. And there's a reason for that. Asteraceae members are composite blooms, which means that you see, you think of a sunflower and we think of a, one sunflower bloom as being one flower, 
But in reality, that disc in the center of a sunflower, the big circle in the inside, uh, where you get all the seeds from, those are a, a large composite of flowers. So there are hundreds of individual flowers um, or dozens, depending on the species. There are multiple flowers within what we think of as one bloom. So it's really kind of like a buffet for butterflies. They can land on one bloom and just sit and nectar at all of the multiple flowers. So very, the, pretty much all the Asteraceae family members are very attractive to pollinating insects. And we'll start off with one of the best species or genera for monarchs is goldenrod. And here are a couple of my favorite species there. We have on the left, um, the uh, Solidago mexicana, it used to be in the genus or in the species Solidago sempervirens, but it is now Solidago mexicana and it is called seaside goldenrod. And that one grows all along the coast. And I just see the monarchs just covering the species in the fall. And then on the right, we have Solidago rugosa. And so Florida has over 25 species of native Solidago goldenrods, which is a, a lot. Um, at, but a lot of them are actually available in the nursery trade now. Um, the species I mentioned here, Seaside Goldenrod, Solidago Mexicana, Juan Goldenrod, Solidago Vergata, which used to be Solidago Stricta, Wreath Goldenrod, Solidago Xicia, Sweet Goldenrod, Solidago Odora, not Odor. I think my spell check caught me there. Um, those are the ones that I see the most often available in the nursery trade. Uh, but really any native, as long as it's native, any native goldenrod will be so beneficial for butterflies, monarchs, and other species. Pretty much all of them bloom in late summer to fall. So they're really peaking uh, at this time of year. And then, and you'll see a theme here with the colors. There's a lot of purple and a lot of yellow in the fall. And they're mostly Asteraceae family members, the Aster family. So ironweed is another excellent choice for monarchs and butterflies in general. It's another fall bloomer as all the ones I'm talking about right now are. But it, as all of them are, it's a composite bloom and there are, variety of species in Florida, seven to be specific, uh, and several of them are common in the horticultural industry. And so giant ironweed, Vernonia gigantea, Florida sandhill ironweed, um, Vernonia angustifolia varmorii. New York ironweed is one of my favorites because it's just show, so showy. The one that you see in both of these photos here is New York ironweed, the um, Vernonio Nove Borsensis. And then Missouri ironweed as well is also pretty available in the nursery trade and very lovely. All of these plants do look very similar um, until you really start to get look closely at them, but they all work really well. And a lot of these species are will grow in varying different habitats. And same with the goldenrod as well. So whether you have a moist soil or rich soil or dry sandy soil, you can find species that will do well in either. So here's a special plant that is endemic to Florida, doesn't occur anywhere else except for central Florida. And this is Garberia heterophylla, Garber scrub stars. And I got to see this species for the first time um, since I'm up in the panhandle, I don't get to see it a few years ago, and it is just stunning. It's a sh small shrub, low, fairly low growing, a few feet tall, and it is just pro produces prolific blooms in fall and is highly attractive to monarchs and other butterflies. Okay, so we're talking about Asteraceae family members, but there's a genus that's commonly known as asters because they used to be in the genus Aster, but now they're in the genus Cynthia trichum. And these are what we think of as asters, really. They um, have showy ray petals, um, ray flowers. So if you, can you guys see my pointer, Valerie? 
Yeah. So you can see here, these are the what we call the disc flowers in the center. Oops. And then these, what we think of as petals are actually individual flowers with one like petal. And um, these, this family tends to have pretty showy ones. So you can see here, these flowers just beginning to open. And then these are actually flowers right here. So there are over 30 species native to Florida. They can be very difficult to differentiate as well, um, but several of them are very common in, in the nursery trade and are pretty easy to grow and really showy. Eastern silver aster, Cynthia trichum concolor, is one of the more common species in Florida and the Southeast. And it is um, very showy purple, very, it's, um, that's not the one it, uh, right there, but. Um, Elliot's aster on the top right, that's um, a super great, robust, large plant that grows in moist to average soils. And it gets big, like taller than me. And it produces so many flowers. And it is just stunning. But give it space to grow because it is a robust species. And then we have rice button aster, Cynthia trichum dumosum. That's the white one here. And calico aster, Cynthia trichum latifolium, that's another very easy to grow. Um, a lot of these species even, you'll notice them, you might even have them coming up in your yard or around your side yard. I have Cynthia trichum latifolium just growing in my hedges naturally. Uh, and the big purple flowers that you see right here, that is a species um, that is a, actually a listed species. It is Cynthia trichum georgianum, the Georgia aster. It's pretty rare, but very easy to grow. And so you can find most of these plants in the uh, horticultural trade and you can find other native ones. But again, as long as you're planting native Cynthia trichum, then you're good to go. Okay, rosin weed. This is a beautiful species that is beginning to be more recognized and used more often, which makes me very happy. It is, a, it's interesting because it, it does bl often bloom in the spring and then it will have another flush later in the summer and fall. Um, and it's extremely tough, very easy to grow. And so there are three species native to Florida, the typical rosin weed, it was, common, it was misidentified in Florida as Stilphium asteriscus, but um, recent work has proven that the one that we have most common in Florida is actually a different species. We do have asteriscus in Florida, but the most common species we have in Florida is Stilphium simpsonii. And um, that's the one that you see here on the left, the large photo. And then there's Florida rosin weed, Silphium compositum, and there are two distinct varieties of it in Florida. And that's those species that you see in the top right. That one gets very tall. I've seen some specimens that are taller than me, the stalks. Um, and then starry rosin weed, Silphium asteriscus. There are two distinct varieties of that species in Florida. It looks very similar to this uh, Silphium simpsonii, the one, on the photo on the left but um, asteriscus typically has more leaves on the um, blooming bloom stalks inflorescences. And then this is a favorite. If you, you know, have a pollinator garden, you definitely need to have this one. And it is such a magnet for butterflies and monarchs love it because it blooms right in the fall when they are migrating. Snow square stem Melanthera nivea is a really interesting and robust, another robust species that you've got to give a lot of space to, um, but it blooms over a long, fairly long period of time and is super attractive to monarchs. And then we have the chafe heads, the carfiferous species. It's a really fun genus to pronounce. Um, we have on the left, flatwood chafe head, carfiferous corymbosis. This one only occurs in Northeast Florida and in Peninsula, Florida. It doesn't 
naturally occur in the panhandle where I am, but it's a wonderful species for butterflies and monarchs. And then lavender lady is Carfiferous pseudoliatris. Um, pseudo means fake, right? And liatris, we know, I hope you know what liatris is, is um, the blazing star. So pseudoliatris means looks like the blazing star or fake blazing star. And that's a really um, prolific species. I haven't seen it very often in the nursery trade. I have seen Carfiferous corymbosis in the nursery trade, but both of them are wonderful species to plant for monarchs. And then these two species used to be in the genus Carfiferous, and they are now in a different genus, uh, Trelisa. So we have Trelisa odoratissima, commonly known as vanilla leaf. It was called it, vanilla leaf because if you've ever been walking in the woods in winter when these plants have dried up and you walk over them, the dried leaves smell like vanilla and they were used as flavoring for tobacco products for a long time. They might still be, I don't know. Uh, but that's a great species. It has a more kind of humble um, type of bloom, shape of bloom that's a little bit more open and then we have Trelisa uh, paniculata, which looks very similar, but it's much more tight and erect in um, its inflorescence. So both species are wonderful for uh, monarch butterflies in the fall. And then sunflowers, of course, sunflowers are great pollinator um, pollinator plants, but especially for monarchs, because again, they're blooming like right in October. A lot of this, a lot of these species, especially the most common one in North Florida, at least, is Helianthus angustifolius, the nearly sunflower. And that one really peaks right in October when we get them big population of monarchs coming through. So they're time, time to well. And then there are there is beach sunflower, which is common in the nursery industry, Helianthus debilis, woodland sunflower, Helianthus divericatus, savanna sunflower, Helianthus heterophyllus. That's the one photo pictured on the left. And there are lots of species of Helianthus in Florida, um, over 15. And they can be difficult to differentiate, but as long as you're getting a native species, then that's what's really important. And I will mention, since I haven't mentioned yet, common names. I, I make sure to mention the genus and species, which, which is its Latin binomial. And that's like a human human's first name and last name. It's like what how people recognize us, right? So common names could be anything, you know, any, there is no standardization within common names. So different people call different species by different names. And so that can become really confusing when you're trying to talk about a specific entity. And so using the Latin binomial, especially when you're looking for plants to procure is really important because then you know exactly what you're getting. If you use a common name, you know, that's, they can be interchangeable. So important to use a Latin binomial. Okay, hammock snake fruit, Adiratina jacunda. This is a fall blooming Astraceae family member. And it is another one that is pretty available in the nursery industry, very easy to grow and very prolific in its flowering and its ability to attract butterflies. Black-eyed Susans, I'm sure you'll be familiar with since they're also pretty common in the nursery trade. We have over 10 species native to Florida. Um, the two species you see here, the one on the left is Rebecca triloba, and the one on the right is Rebecca fulgida. And those are both species that are pretty common in the nursery industry and great for attracting butterflies. And of course, we mentioned Liatris earlier. They are commonly known as Blazing Star and there are several species in Florida, 19 or more probably, um, uh, that are all great for butterflies. They all 
pretty much bloom late summer to fall. And they actually, there are actually species that even people think of about this plant as being a full sun plant, but there is a species that's endemic to the panhandle where I am that actually grows in quite a bit of shade. And that's the Golson's blazing star, Leatris golsonii down here. But the most common species we see is dense blazing star, which used to be classified as uh, Leatris spicata, but it is now has the taxonomic work has changed it to Leatris resinosa. And Chapman's blazing star is a great, um, great plant for sandier areas and very stunning. And that's Leatris chapmanii. And then slender blazing star Leatris gracilis is pretty common in the nursery trade as well. And it's common across Florida and very stunning. All of these plants are just killer. The This up here on the right is Leatris gracilis. On the left, we have Leatris elegans, the elegant blazing star. And I've seen that available at a few native plant nurseries. And it is a stunner species with these showy bracts. And then this one right here on the lower right-hand side is Leatris aspera, which I recently saw for the first time um, blooming in situ in Florida. It's very rare in Florida, but man, there were butterflies all over it. And there is even a little praying mantis hanging out behind the blooms trying to wait for an unsuspecting pollinator. Okay, rattlesnake master. There are several species that are available um, that are native to Florida, but the most readily available species, and the one that adapts to quite a bit, quite a few variety of soils, is Eryngium aquaticum. And this species and this genus and in, in entirely is um, larval food for swallowtail butterflies. So, like black eastern swallowtails in particular, use this plant as a larval food host. So you're kind of, you're getting, killing, not killing, you're, you're uh, feeding two butterfly species with one plant. Joe pieweed is well known as being an excellent butterfly plant. And again, it blooms in fall, just like all of these Esteraceae members. And there are two species native to Florida, the hollow stem joe pieweed, Eutrochium fistulosum, and then purple joe pieweed, Eutrochium purpureum. And both are wonderful. They're both fairly large plants, especially the Eutrochium, Eutrochium purpureum. It, it gets pretty big. And then this, I, I've seen it a few times available in the nursery trade, but I really wanted to mention it because if it's more growers should grow it. It's a really great perennial that's super tough. Um, it's salt salt tolerant and drought resistant. And this is narrow leaf yellow tops, Flavaria linearis. And it looks a lot like a goldenrod, but it's in a different genus and it is really tough, a really tough plant that I would love to see available more, more often. And I always see monarchs and other butterflies on it. Brickelia. So this is a really interesting species that has very large blooms um, for this type of aster. And Brickelia cordifolia is the um, most readily available species in the nursery industry. We have a few other species, I think two more species, but this one is definitely the showiest and the most readily available. And my goodness, it is so, it is such a butterfly magnet. I mean, there are a few in here that are exceptional butterfly magnets, but this plant in particular, man, the butterflies just adore it. And it's pretty adaptable even to part sun, full sun to part shade, and I would say average to moist soils. Silkgrass asters, the Pityopsis species. We have over 10 species that are native to Florida and they grow from wet, mucky soils to dry, sandy soils. And they are such an underutilized species. They 
have the potential to be, a, I think, a turf grass substitute. They're slower growing than turf grass is, but they grow, can grow, some species can grow just as densely. They can withstand being walked on and withstand being mowed or even driven over and they bloom in the fall. And so most of the year you just see these silvery, they're called silk grass because the leaves have these fine um, silky hairs that give it a kind of silvery cast. You can see them on the stem here. And those, um, the leaves are up year round. And so they they look just like a grass really most of the year until fall comes and then they send up these taller stalks with flowers. And it's a wonderful plant that is available at some nurseries and I would love to see more of them available. I would love to see this plant actually available in plugs. That would be really wonderful. If you're a grower attending this talk, see if you could grow silkgrass aster in plugs for turf grass. Okay, so saltbush baccarus species. Um, there are three species native to Florida, and this is another one of those like incredibly attractive to monarchs in particular plants. Um, so this these plants, um, all three species are dioecious, which, which means that each individual plant is either male or female. And so they have the males and the females have different shaped flowers. And the males are most attractive to the monarchs because the males produce much more nectar. So these two plants here are male individuals, uh, Bacchus helimifolia, and they are this is a very common species, the co most common one in Florida, and some even really consider it weedy because it will pop up and spread, but it's beautiful, super attractive to butterflies. It has a kind of unruly habit, I would say, and its shape is not very uniform, but it's a stunning plant for like a mixed bed or border. And the female plants look like this. They have that typical saltbush showy white um, pappus that is so beautiful. It's soft and silky to the touch. And as the seed ripens down here, the um, the white fluff releases and will, uh, people will call it Florida snow sometimes because it will fly off in the air and like land on the ground and get caught in the air. It's just beautiful. So a wonderful species uh, or um, a wonderful genus to plant. It's like a small shrub. If I didn't mention that, some of them can get fairly tall, like eight, 10 feet possibly, but they are beautiful and should not be overlooked for a butterfly garden. And then another plant that I often see butterflies on that is um, the first plant I'm mentioning that's not in the Asteraceae family, and this is in the Solanaceae family, which is the same family that tomatoes and peppers and potatoes are in. And this is Lyceum carolinianum, Christmas berry, and it blooms in fall, and the monarchs, again, love it. And it's a coastal plant. It has these succulent leaves that are kind of thick and fleshy. And then these beautiful pale lavender flowers that the monarchs like to enjoy. And then it's called Christmas berry because it does produce little red fruit. They look a lot like goji berries, if you've ever seen a fresh goji berry, and they're edible as well. So another reason to plant a lyceum. And so this is not a nectarine plant, Southern red cedar, Juniperus silicicola. But it is heavily, it is very often used for roosting for migrating monarchs. They will all hang in these trees in the evening. I see them, sometimes you'll see like hundreds on one tree. And they um the thick and evergreen leaves or needles actually are so dense that they provide some like wind protection and lots of surface area for monarchs to cling on to. And it seems to be a preferred plant for roosting for the night for monarch butterflies. So it's definitely worth planting this species. And it's also larval food for another 
butterfly, some, I think it's a species of hair streak. Juno, I can't remember, don't quote me on that. Okay, and so now we're moving on to the spring flowering nectar plants. So after the monarchs have gone through their winter diapause where they're just basically resting in Mexico, then they start heading north again and migrating um, through uh, Florida, North Florida. And so there are a few species of milkweed that I'm gonna mention because they are really important for nectaring and also as a larval food because those, once they start heading north in spring, they are ready to start mating and laying eggs on milkweed. And these species are important. The first one being sandhill milkweed, Asclepius humistrata. And this species is notoriously difficult to find plants of in, in order to plant, but it is definitely being grown more and more. It's a learning curve for growers to figure out how to grow some of these species. And so it has taken a little bit of time and then it takes more time to build up enough stock for to meet the demand. Um, but it is coming along and it's definitely worth planting. It, it requires well-drained soils. So if you have rich, too rich or too damp soil, it's not the plant for you. But if you live in central or south Florida this, and you have sandier soils, this is a great one. And then butterfly weed is Sclepius tuberosa, which we have a few varieties of that are native to Florida. This is, uh, it actually blooms in spring as well, a little bit after the Asclepius humistrata, but the monarchs are still migrating north when this species blooms. And so they use both the leaves and the flowers for nectar. And it's also just a very, this species is called butterfly weed because it's a popular plant for nectaring butterflies. They, all sorts of butterflies love it. This is a zebra swallowtail here on this one. And then white swamp milkweed, Asclepius perennis. This is um, an unusual species. It's definitely an outlier in our 21 species of native milkweed in Florida um, for two reasons. For one, it grows and it will grow in standing water. It will actually grow in water that is inundated and can withstand, you know, flooding. And it also, because of that reason, because it's adapted to be in wet areas where flowing, flowing water is nearby, it doesn't have the typical comas, the white fluffy thing that is attached to a milkweed seed. You see the milkweed pods open and then the seeds catch the air and they fly off with those white fluffy things. Those are called comas. And all of our other native milkweed species have a coma for each seed, which is like a little parachute that catches the air and disperses the seed for the plant. This species doesn't rely on wind for seed dispersal. It can rely on moving water nearby. So it doesn't have a coma. The seeds are actually naked. So it's the only species that has naked seeds like that. It's also our only native milkweed species that is likely to be self-fertile, which means that you don't need to have two genetically distinct individuals in order to create seed. Most of our milkweeds, I always recommend planting two or three because one genetic individual cannot pollinate itself. So the flowers on one plant alone can't self-pollinate themselves. They require another different genetic individual in order to have cross-pollination and to in order to successfully produce seed. But this species is different. It seems to be self-fertile and produces copious amounts of seed which has made it much more readily available in the nursery industry because it's much more easy. It's just easier to produce. So um, this species is also unique in that it's one, it's probably our only species that has a tendency to stay above ground um, in the winter even. So that can sometimes be an issue because of the OE problem that we mentioned earlier, the parasites that can accumulate on the leaves of, um, of, of milkweed species. But um, cutting it back, trimming it back in 
uh, after the fall, like in winter is a good idea. And sometimes it does just naturally defoliate. Um, so yeah, just a few things to keep in mind. But the, the flower is actually popular as a nectarine source for uh, butterflies as well. Okay, so moving on to other spring blooming plants. So a lot of the spring bloomers are not in the Asteraceae family, they're in other plant families. And we have six species of viburnum that are native to Florida. And these are fairly large shrubs, depending on the species, they can be, you know, five to 10 feet tall. And all of the species are pretty much, pretty highly attractive to butterflies. I often see them fluttering about over these white, fluffy blooms. And um, these are just great landscape plants as well. So I definitely recommend adding a viburnum. Uh, the species on the right here is viburnum nudum. And then the species on the left is um, viburnum. Oh, why, am, why am I forgetting it? It's Walter's viburnum. I can't remember the species name, but it's very common in the nursery industry. And I'm sure Valerie's already on it finding that species name for you guys. And then black cherry is a really common, almost weedy native tree that is really used readily by a lot of butterfly species. It blooms in spring, it produces a lot of nectar and butterflies really like those to visit those blooms. And then buttonbush is a stellar, just a stellar butterfly plant. It um, is a, you know, fairly large shrub, usually about five, probably six to 10 feet tall. Um, it's in the Rubiaceae family. Uh, the genus and species is Cephalanthus occidentalis. It often grows along the edges of wetlands, but it's fairly adaptable to average soils as long as it's not too dry or too sandy. And it has these ball, these actual spherical blooms that are very Dr. Seuss-like and, and super attractive to butterflies. And I love watching the butterflies nectarine on this plant. This was actually the first native plant that I, that I identified, that I actually saw in the field and was like, what is that thing? It's so unique looking. And I found a field guide and figured out what it was. It was one of the entry plants to native plants for me. Okay, so those are the plants. Now, how do you find the plants? This is always a key issue when trying to resource native plants. You figure out what species you want and then where do you get them? There's always been less demand or sorry, less supply for native plants than there has been for uh, tropical, non-native, and even invasive plants. You can find invasive plants much more readily in a, in a garden center than um, a native plant, but there are great resources and I'm gonna go through them now. So plantrealflorida.org is a great website that everybody should know about. It is um, created by the Florida Association of Native Nurseries, commonly known by its acronym FAN, F-A-N-N. -N. And they have so many great resources on their website, but the top one I recommend is you go to plantrealflorida.org and you click on retail native plants up there on the menu. And then it will show you a map of Florida and you can find a native plant nursery near you. And then you can click on that nursery and it will give you all of the contact information and give you a little synopsis about the nursery. And then they'll even have uh, a plant list of plants that are commonly carried by this nursery. You can't rely on the plant list listed online to be in stock. If you wanted to go visit, you need to call ahead and ask if you have a list of what you're looking for. But these, um, these are all independent native plant nurseries and they are w run by wonderful people who are usually very accommodating if you're trying to look for specific plants. They'll you If they don't have them in stock, they'll often take your name and number and let you know when they do get in stock and try to resource the plants for you. And then we have um, Mail Order Natives is a great native plant nursery in Lee, Florida up in the Panhandle here. 
And you can order a lot of native species. And these are Florida native ecotypes. Almost most of these are. And you can even get native milkweeds and have them mailed to you through mail order natives. So that's another great resource. And then if you want to try growing from seed, um, a lot of these Asteraceae family members are pretty easy to grow from seed. And the best resource for Florida ecotype is Florida Wildflower Growers Cooperative. And they have a website online and you can purchase seed online and have it mailed to you. And so I mentioned the word ecotype and that ecotype means, um, so for instance, um, red maple is native from Florida all the way up to Canada on the East Coast. But if you tried to get a red maple that, if you tried to grow from seed a red maple that came from Canada, it would not prosper well down here, even though it's genetically the same genus and species. And that's because they're different ecotypes they have differences, they have evolved over time, even though those genetic differences are not distinct enough to differentiate them into a different species, they are distinct enough to make it adaptable to very different climates. So where you get your plant, so where your plant material is sourced is really important. Same with Asclepius tuberosa, the butterfly weed. That species is native across the US, like all the way, over to like New Mexico. <laughs> when I was out there, I saw it. And the spe species, the individual, individual plants that are going to do best here are plants that come from existing Florida plants. So you, the term we use is ecotype. So you want Florida ecotype. And that means that it came from, a, I, from, from seed mostly from um, a native Florida plant. So that's always important when you're buying native plants in general. And that's it. Um, uh, plant, plant the plants and, and the butterflies will come. And I will go ahead and open it up for questions with Valerie. Thank you so much, Lily. Yeah. Uh, let's see, we've got a number of questions here in the chat. Uh, the most recent one is from Dorinda, who says that uh, she has a Florida milk vine and she's never seen a monarch visit it. Uh, the leaves seem very tough and she wants to know if you know why. They don't, pref they don't tend to prefer milk vine. I have tried to force <laughs> caterpillars to eat milk vine. You know, I was rearing caterpillars and ran out of milkweed and I tried to um, get them to eat the milk vine and they will sometimes eat it, but they often don't prefer it. And sometimes they'll just reject it. And so, you know, everything in nature is just much more com complex than we initially think it is. And monarchs are one of those species. So uh, the reason that monarchs uh, use milkweed is because it has a toxin in it, uh, cardinaloid that is, um, can cause cardiac arrest essentially in a lot of mammals like us. <laughs> so don't eat them. Um, but th by eating the leaves of milkweed, they are ingesting and accumulating that toxin, which makes them toxic to their predators. So they, uh, they dance this fine line, everything, evolution is an arms race and they are dancing this fine line of how much of those cardinaloids can the monarch itself maintain without it being adversely affected while still, you know, having enough to be toxic to its predator. So they're always evolving back and forth and the different species of milkweed and the different milk vines have varying concentration of the cardinaloids and toxins. And so whatever, you know, you start a um, a monarch begins eating, if it starts eating one species, often sometimes it doesn't want to switch to a totally different genera or it has to compensate with how much um, cardinaloids it already has accumulated. It might not want a plant that has too much if it has already eaten too much. So it's unpredictable is the gist of what I'm trying to say is Sometimes they will eat it and sometimes they won't. Um, it's the same thing with butterfly weed. 
butterfly weed, Asclepias tuberosa, has the least amount of cardenoloids, the toxins, in, out of all of our native milkweeds. And sometimes the, in, the monarchs don't prefer that species because they want a plant with more cardenoloids. Um, so yeah, that was a long answer to a short question. And then back to saltbush, um, Jackie Wild Floridian asks uh, if she can use saltbush as a hedge, like a privacy hedge. Does it get thick and bushy? You can try it. it. It's, it's not, I would call it an unruly plant. Um, I would, it's not quite one that seems easily trainable. I think once once a plant is mature and gets fairly large and woody, which would take years to reach that point, it might be able to be shaped a little bit more, but I would not advise it. <laughs> I don't think it would be very successful. It definitely, what I prefer rather than a hedge is like a mixed hedge of plants where you have a variety of species that create a screen. Cause a lot of people are trying to create privacy in their yard with hedges. Um, but you can use more than just one species. Diversity is important. And so as long as you mix in a bunch of different species, you can trim them to be as you want. And each plant doesn't have to be a specific shape is basically what I'm getting at. Awesome, that's a good idea. Um, Catherine Miller says the monarchs decimate the milkweed in her garden, uh, leaving sticks behind. They never grow very big, what should I do? Uh, what species? I don't know what species. Um, wait, can you read that again? Uh, they, they just the monarchs decimate. They just eat oh, all yeah. of her, all of her milkweed. So there's yeah. just no leaves left for them to, you know, they can't grow because they just keep getting eaten. So I'm assuming she's probably in Central Florida, with constant monarch pressure, or Central or South yeah. Florida. Yeah, and so you know the thing is, is like, it's natural and normal for monarchs to run out of milkweed. That's just part of the natural cycle. Um, I know it's like hard for us to see like this poor caterpillar hanging on, but the less we interfere with nature, really the better off it usually is. And so uh, providing, recreating native ecosystems and native habitat in your yard is the most key part. And then allowing those species, the monarchs, to adjust to that and live their life is the best way to support monarchs. But trying to baby them, you know, and coddle them can actually, in the long term, be harmful to the species as a whole. So, you know, yeah, sometimes caterpillars die, unfortunately. Okay. Um person asks, uh, what other pl what plant other than citrus is a host to the giant swallowtail butterfly? Uh, our native hop tree. So that's the native plant that uh, the giant swallowtail butterflies use. That's Telia. Um, oh, I can't remember the species name, but it's P-T-E-L-E-A. And it's a tree that's in the Rutaceae family, the citrus family. And it's really lovely. The common name is wafer ash. Um, it's, I, I see, I, I see it up here growing wild in the ravines that I survey for Terea taxifolia. Uh, and it's, it's a lovely species and you can, yeah, plant, plant a native plant for the uh, giant swallowtails. My mic on, sorry. Yeah. Petelia trifoliata, hop tree. So the P, the P is silent. So Petelia. it's Telia. Petelia. Yeah. Petelia. Trifoliata. Mm -hmm. Trifoliata. I don't know if we have a plant. Let me see if we have a plant list for that. We do. We do. Okay, so I'm going to put that in the chat. Great. Yeah. yeah that, that tree is pretty common in the nursery industry because it's larval food for the swallowtail butterfly. Okay. Uh, next. Uh... Okay, and Dorinda has a follow-up question. So bringing in the cats, caterpillars, bringing them, bringing them inside to save them from paper wasps is not a good idea. I know it sounds counterintuitive, um, but research, current research is showing that we are 
hard because so many people are rearing so many monarch caterpillars, it is weakening the species as a whole. So every time a species, uh, individual caterpillar dies, that's selection, that's evolution. Um, and when we interfere with that process, um, we are essentially breeding them to be, you know, less, less susceptible, I guess I would say, or, or more susceptible to outside factors. And we also increase the likelihood that we are amplifying the OE, the parasite issue. So it's okay to rear some, but, you know, there it's been really popular for people you know, who are so passionate about monarchs to rear hundreds and hundreds every summer. Um, and that has definitely been shown to be very harmful. Um, and so if you want to do it for educational purposes or rear a couple of them a year, you know, and I would go to the Xerces Society website and they have a protocol for how to safely rear monarchs um, and to, um avoid having the uh, OE, the parasite uh, load get too high. So yeah, it's we should be doing that sparingly, but we shouldn't be raising them indoors in large quantities. Yeah, I think, you know, because we've heard so much about the monarch for so long, people are seeing, you know, rearing indoors as a way that they can really help. Yeah, yeah. And, and it feels so good to be able to help a species, but planting native is the biggest thing, removing invasives and planting, increasing the diversity of native plants in your yard and planting what would have originally been in that, your area where you live is really the best way to support all species and to support ourselves as well, because we rely on the ecosystems that function and um, we have to, we have to plant in order to um, build them back. Right, because we're not, you know, say you're raising a bunch of monarchs and then releasing them into an environment that, you know, cannot support them. You know, they, the idea is we're creating a bunch of habitat in our you know, neighborhoods and so that they can, you know, be a part of an ecosystem that we're also a part of, despite, you know, having to live in suburbia and cities and stuff. Yeah. Yeah, we're still benefiting from all the services provided by the ecosystems around us yeah. that are getting smaller and smaller every day. Um, a good question from Suzanne Kennedy. What kind of growing containers are the most environmentally safe for starters, pint, quart, and gallon sizes? And where do we find growing supplies for native plants, including organic growth media? Um, I don't, as far as the plastic pots like what's the most ecological really whatever you, I, I would say whatever used pots you can source would be the most you know ecologically friendly you know just not buying new but there is there has been a shortage of black plastic pots that are the standard nursery pots um, in the last couple of years since the pandemic with all the supply chain issues so um really <laughs> any containers that you can figure out, like you can use leftover, um, you know, yogurt containers or margarine containers and just cut enough um, holes and large enough holes in the bottoms of them to use. So really just recycling in a way, um, reusing things, that would be the most ecologically sound um, pot to use. And then, um, as far as growing medium, you know, I would just go to find the na closest native plant nursery near you and um, talk to them about growing mediums. They likely have um, seed starting mix. But you can also like if you're starting these plants from seed, I would recommend rather than starting them in pots, I would recommend sowing them directly where you want them to grow and just sowing a little bit more than you and want to have in the end, because inevitably you're gonna lose some, some won't germinate, some won't get eaten by a caterpillar or something and won't make it. 
But um, planting them where you want them to grow is usually easier in the long run and they tend to perform and do better as well. Awesome, thanks Lily. Um, Randy Snyder, very kind, and Mark Elliott point out that there's Hercules Club, Xanthosylum also in Central Florida. Oh yes. Giant yes. Yeah. yeah, thank you. And those look citrusy, you know, but also very spiky. Yes, they have thorns but they are in the Rutaceae family as well. Um, and Mark also says that Gage, so that's Gage Lafier of, um, he's doing the UF Native Plant Nurseries. He's done a bunch of presentations at our conference, great native plant researcher. Um, he's using containers for Asclepius humistrata. Yeah, so people have used, so some of the sandhill species, but Asclepius humistrata in particular, ha, uh, before they send up hardly any leafy leaves or above ground growth, they start growing a very deep taproot that goes straight down. And that can be an issue. I talked about some of the issues that growers are facing trying to learn how to grow these species. That's the big one with Asclepius humistrata is it wants to form this very long tap taproot before it does much above ground growth. And so people have tried to figure out ways of successfully growing these plants in pots, which has been difficult, but some people have used PVC pipes to grow them in and these large, long cone shaped pots. Um, but again, if you can get seed from that species, if you can direct sow it, then that's always going to be much more successful. Um, and yeah, so if you can source plants, you wanna, you would, it, it's a good sign if it comes in a lar long pot. Um, but it, it becomes an issue for sellers, for retailers, because they have to try to figure out how to market these teeny tiny plants in these really long pots. And, you know, a lot of people see that plant and, and are not willing to pay $15 for it or whatever they have to charge because they spent so much time and effort and energy and resources creating this little guy. Um, and so that's, so those are some of the issues that, that um, affect the supply and demand with um, native milkweeds. Thanks, Lily. Um, CJ Taylor says the Citrus County Landfill has a bin for a pot exchange so that you can check with your county. Oh, great. Dump. Yeah. You might want to consider like using like a light bleach solution to clean out the pots just because, you know, you know, disease and bacteria can travel. And especially if they were pots that were grown on a large commercial scale, they often accrue certain pests and diseases. But um, yeah, that's a great way to, to um, get some recycled pots. I'm just going to look up and see if we have anything else in the chat. Oh, early on, um, Randy and Mary point out that Juniper Hair Streak uses the yes. red cedar. Yes, thank you. I thought it was Juniper Hair Streak, but I didn't want to <laughs> get it wrong. Other than that, you know, people are asking if this is going to be recorded. Yes, all of our Lunches and Learns are recorded. Now, public ones are, you know, available to the public. Members only are recorded and available to members only. And so if you get the emails, every time I send out a weekly notification email, you'll see that I have the link to all the public ones and all of the members only ones. And if you remember the public, we have a Lunch and Learn playlist that you can see on our YouTube channel. So just check out our YouTube channel, list of playlists, and then you can see all of the ones that have been public when they were aired. And then also I've gone back and made some that were just really good and I thought should be public information uh, as public. So that's a really great resource if you have a chance. Yeah. We all owe Valerie a big applause for all of her work on uh, these very informative and, and interesting lunch and learn she does. Thank you. It's a lot of work. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, oh, uh, Kate asks, do the pesticides absorb into the pots? No. I mean, they might be on the pots, but they're not in the plastic. Just a lot of thank yous, and that's all the Great. questions that are in the chat. Awesome. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed it, and um, yeah, plant some native plants. 
Okay, I hope everyone has a great weekend. Join the, join the Florida Native Plant Society and plant native.